Hello everyone, today is Thursday, February 28, 2019, and this is the week in charts. I noticed that I did not change my chart to say week in charts, but it is a week in charts. And today we're going to talk about a simple strategy for trading hot IPOs. I like to stick with what's sort of relevant. It's kind of interesting. People who follow me, they're like, he just trades a bunch of crazy speculative biotechs and then a month or two later, some people will follow me and they're like, he just trades a bunch of crazy IPOs. And people who were following me several months ago when the market was tanking were probably thinking, this guy just shorts a bunch of big cap stocks. So I like to go where the action is as a trend follower and as some people call me a trend following moron. Now, before we get into all that, there was a disclaimer screen. I could sum it up really quickly. And if you've been trading for more than a day, you know these things. All predictions are about the future and a lot of stuff can happen between now and then. That comes from Greg Morris. Now, we're going to, I left out the slide for the how we proceed, but for those who are new to the show, if you don't mind, while we're on the slides, keep your questions to what's on the slides, and then once we get to the live charts, if, there, if there's some questions you want to answer, if you want answered, we could always come back to the slides if I need to draw on a screen or something. Also, when we get to the live charts, feel free to start asking about stocks. Just ask about them one at a time, one ticker at a time, that is, and then hit return. That way, I can guarantee that I can get to as many as possible, and hopefully all of them by the end of the show. Anyway, so in case you're wondering, today's research comes directly from my IPO course and my members area. Some of the newer stuff is in the members area under the IPOs, which will eventually become part of the IPO course too. And speaking of which, the course for the IPOs is at davelander.com slash trade IPOs. And then I was thinking right before I went live, if you entered, a, I decided to put a promo code on. So if you enter IPO 200, you'll get $200 off and then you'll get three months to the members area, which will give you plenty of time to check out the newer IPO stuff there. And I have a feeling once you get there, you'll stay even longer. So far, I've been very happy with that. So the question is, why IPOs? Well, they hold the promise of the future, and you can make a lot of money, even if the promise doesn't materialize, and that's why I have the word promise in quotes. I was thinking earlier, it's like I, have, I have, usually have no idea what an IPO does, and I trade them, and I'll trade them and use money management. Sometimes I lose, obviously, but sometimes I'll win small, and then sometimes I'll trail the stop and then eventually get stopped out. And the whole trade will go into my account, and especially the profitable ones, it's like, hey, that was great. I have no idea what this company did, but I find myself saying, well, so long, and thanks for all the fish. And then I run out and try to find another one and another one. Now, several years ago, I held off doing an IPO course thinking that, well, as soon as I do an IPO course, the IPO bull market's going to end. And this happened for like a year and then another year, another year. So finally, I got around to doing one. I almost did a service around that time. And now I'm kicking myself in the butt. The, I guess one of the problems with the service, other than probably jinxing the IPO market, and like I said to a group a while back in a seminar, the day I do an IPO service will probably be the... Uh, the nail in the coffin the last day that the IPO bull market lives. But so far, what's pretty amazing is the bull market chugs along. And even when conditions get kind of questionable, you end up with this great dichotomy to where some just go down, or most just go down, I should say, but the few that go up are worth trading. You avoid the ones that go down, as you'll see in a few minutes, and you just go along the ones that go up. It's almost that simple. And again, the dichotomy is fantastic. If you were to look at some sort of IPO index or you're watching some sort of news on IPOs, they'd be like, IPOs are doing horrible. They're down 50% for the year. Well, yeah, 70 or 80 or even 90% of them might be down significantly, but it's those 10% that go up are the ones that are worth trading and they just avoid the ones that go down. And I'll flesh that out in just one second. So the IPO bull market just keeps chugging along and someday it's going to end, but I want to show you a simple strategy that is going to keep you in most of the ones that go up and then keep you out of trouble when they go down. Now, the beautiful thing about IPOs is often they either fly or die. And I'll flesh that out in quite a bit of details. 
Now, I suppose if you've been trading for more than a couple of days, you know the story of the sardines. So let me just kind of rush through it once again. It's kind of interesting. Linda Rasky recently asked me to proof her book, and I just I have a brand new copy of it right here. And she went with the title Trading Sardines. Well, the sardine story, which has been told over and over again, is that at some point in time there was a bull market in sardine tens and people were trading the sardine tens left and right and the price got higher and higher and higher and higher and higher and then one guy bought some very expensive sardines and decided that he was going to sit down and eat them for lunch and enjoy a very expensive lunch and he opens them up and they're rotten and he tracks down the last guy and says hey man you sold me some rotten sardines and he said, you silly fool, those sardines are for trading, not eating. And that's kind of like with IPOs. They're for trading. You're not investing in these things. And that's why I said earlier, kind of set things up with, I have no idea half the time what these companies do, other than the general sector. Now, I'm a big fan of symbolism. This is not in my new office. This is my old office right before I took everything down. But you can see behind me, I have all these currencies from all around the world. And I like to surround myself with symbolism. And over the door of my office, I haven't put it up in this new office, but I do have a, a street sign that says Sardine Drive. And the people in Sardine Drive are really pissed off. But uh, <laughs> anyway, I like the symbolism. And I and when at least when I was in an old office, when I look out the window, I would see this sign constantly all day long and it reminds me that I'm here to trade now it doesn't mean that you are in and out in and out in and out what you're doing is you're using the proper money management to keep you in for hopefully I know I just said hope but hopefully as long as possible and so when I get a stock I hope to be in a stock many 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 years from now in a couple cases I've gotten in a few stocks and I've stayed in for a few years but for the most part, I'm knocked out fairly quickly within weeks and usually months. My current In my current portfolio, the one that's been in there the longest would be UGP, which I put on back in October, and that came straight out the trading service. That's not an IPO, but it gives you an example of how the money management works. So I am willing to stick around longer term. Now, with... The IPOs, obviously, you want to stick around until they begin to stink. Now, Will Rogers, which I think is possibly my brother from another mother, he once said, and obviously he was a little tongue-in-cheek here, but he said, buy stocks that go up. If they don't go up, don't buy them. Well, believe it or not, for the most part, with IPOs, you could pretty much do just that. Now, I thought I was the first trend following moron, but I noticed that he has a trend following moron button on. Now, the number one reason to trade IPOs all boils down to the concrete rule of technical analysis. In other methodologies, such as those that use fundamentals, there are no concrete rules. You can't say buy when a stock has a PE of this and sell it when the PE becomes that. By the way, you ever notice that the most widely used fundamental indicator in the world has price as its numerator. So when people ask me if I use PE, I say yes, but I don't use a denominator. Or I always use a constant denominator of one. Anyway, in other words, I focus on price. But with technical analysis, if a market's going to go to from A to C and B is somewhere in between, it's going to have to pass through B along the way. Now, I, it's not quite as simple as just buying at B with IPOs. But I do actually have a strategy where you buy at B, and then the strategy I'm going to show you today is similar to that buy at B strategy with an added little caveat indicator, and I'll show you that in just a minute. But for the most part, you can look to buy IPOs at B. Now, with stocks in general, stocks in general don't have that great of a breakout characteristic. They break out, but most of the time they come back in. As I was saying in yesterday's Q&A for the members, what happens is the people who trade breakouts, I, I knew one in particular, and he had like a 92% failure rate. Well, trend following, you're going to have a pretty high percent failure rate, and that's why I have a hybrid approach to try to minimize that, but without digressing too far, I know. 
me digress, imagine that. You can, for the most part, trade breakouts in IPOs. So that's kind of a cool thing about IPOs. And it's probably because they don't have the bad memories as a quiet period. And they're priced to with a little meat on the bones. In other words, if the underwriter does his job properly, he brings the stock public at a level where it could still have some room to climb higher. The company doesn't get too greedy of the underwriter, and I'm not sure exactly how that all works. The mechanics of coming public aren't necessarily something that you, you need to know. When I did the IPO course, I talked about a lot of these things. I've probably already forgotten half of it. And I was thinking this morning, it's like there's need to know things and cool to know things. Well, a lot of that stuff is cool to know. But one of the things you need to know is that Yes, the underwriter has a propensity to try to make sure there's some meat left on the bone, so to speak, for the IPO to rally. Now, one thing that I found fascinating about IPOs is that significant new highs and lows are often set during the first week of trading. And as we'll see in just one minute, sometimes the first day. Now, even though that significant high or low could be set on the first day, I would suggest you still wait at least one week before trading. So getting back to our little sardines, they either fly or they die. And as you can see, we have five trading bars here on the screen. So after that first week of trading, many times again, they either go up or they go down. Now the beauty is kind of sort of coming back to the Will Rogers quote, is that you buy them when they go up, and if they don't go up, you don't buy them. So you're going to miss a lot of losing trades. And that's hard to quantify, but if you start to wrap your hat around it, number one, let's say you, you got in a losing trade or you ended up with a losing trade. Well, it's not just the cost of that trade. It's the mental cost, obviously, too, the psychological cost. And it's also getting that money back. Well, if you lose 2%, on a trade, provided you're using proper money management, that's about what you should lose in your account overall. I don't know the exact math off the top of my head. I think it's like 2.1%, but it's 2% and change just to get back to break even. And obviously that grows geometrically as your drawdown increases. If you lose 50% of your account, obviously you have to make back 100% of your account. Now, there's a saying out there saying, in order to win, you must first not lose. Well, I would love not being able to lose in trading, but unfortunately, we get paid to put capital in harm's way, and many times we will lose, and there will be some losers in IPOs. But what I'm going to show you here in just a few minutes is a lot of those losing trades can be avoided by simply waiting for the first week and buying the ones that go up and ignoring the ones that go down. Now, not losing sounds great, but unfortunately, that's a grail hunt. When I used to program trading systems, get up really early in the morning and program trading systems for several hours, and then do other work, afterwards, I got pretty excited when I developed my first profitable trading system, and then I began to think, well, let me just eliminate all of the losses. Well, I quickly found out that I put myself into a grail hunt without even realizing it. So there will be losses, as I've written before, there will be blood. Now, again, the good news is that if the IPO is going to fail, they're often going to fail during the first week and often on the first day. So let's take a look at some examples of that. So again, getting back to my brother from another mother, if they don't go up, don't buy them. So I'm going to show you a few examples here and I did a similar presentation not too long ago for Round the Clock Trader, and I would forgotten how many of these I had put in here. And while I was doing a little research this morning, I made a list of two or three more of these stocks that were failing. And I said, wait a minute, Dave, I think they're going to get the point after a few of these. So here's one that failed on day two. Here's one that failed on day four. And here's one that failed on day two. Now, when snap crap was coming public, not that I confuse the issue with facts often, but I thought that this was the stupidest stock in stupid town. And it turns out that it was. Now, if it, if, if, if it would have gone up, would I have bought it? I don't know. Probably. I probably would have closed my eyes, pinched my nose, 
and bought it if I had a setup and that setup triggered. But what I decided to do was let me come up with a quick little system. And that's where a lot of my research comes from. And that's why I love being in an educational business. It forces me to do the work. My daily analysis, I get paid to do my daily analysis. And I'm, I feel like I'm the luckiest guy on work to get paid for something I would do anyway for something I enjoy doing. And that's in the core trading service. But along those lines, as far as me furthering my own education, it's like, well, let me come up with a simple, simple, simple system that's going to keep people out of these crappy IPOs like Snapcrap has the potential to be. And especially, you got to be especially careful when it's an IPO that's really, really well hyped because you do get this big explosion on the open and that's it. Now, a few weeks after I wrote about this pattern on my website, it was deja vu all over again. Blue Apron came out and it was another one of those well-hyped IPOs. And as you can see here, on day one, it set its all-time highs and then began to implode. And again, as you go through your charts, you're going to see example after example after example. And in many cases, again, day one. Now, when I did this presentation a few weeks back for Round the Clock Trader, somebody said, Dave, all these IPOs going down looks great. Let's just short them. And it's like, well, it's a good idea. Unfortunately, they're hard to borrow or impossible to borrow, at least early in the process. Now, the, the insiders can short to some extent, and I forget exactly how it works. I don't know if it's something to do with the market maker or the insider. They have the ability to short them, but the average guy does not. So even though most of them fail, or I should say many of them fail, depending on market conditions, a lot of them can fail, but you can't just rush out and short them. And I guess one thing that I realize is by showing so many going down, it almost looks like I'm building a case, a negative case for IPOs. No, I'm not. What I'm doing is I'm trying to show you how a lot of them fail, but that's okay. You just stay out of the way. Hey, I like that little, uh, what's his name? Kind of Jesse Jackson, a little bit of who is a glove don't fit. <laughs> anyway, stay out the way. If they're not doing okay, stay out the way. What did I say? I already forgotten. Anyway, one of the most common patterns is the fly and the die. Now, of course, I just showed you the die, so that's another one. So they just die and die. In other words, they come public and just go down. Now, the other pattern, and this is a very much tradable pattern, is the fly and the die. A lot of times they take off, and then they begin to come right back in. And I'll show you a few real examples of trades I've actually taken that turned into flies and dies. So... Again, they take off and then they begin to die. Now, what do you do when they begin to die? Well, you have to be willing to use some proper money management and get out of the way. And I'm going to touch upon that just briefly in a few minutes. So trying to wrap your head around what happens with the fly and die is you have this enthusiasm when they come public, these IPOs come public, and the price begins to shoot up. And the reality, and as I have illustrated here, it's a bad reality. It's like that reality begins to sink in, and then the enthusiasm tends to wane. And while this is all working its way through the system, sometimes these moves might even go parabolic before they begin to implode. Now, when you're trading an IPO, ideally, you want to be in as early as possible. No sooner than the close of the fifth day with the buy at B pattern, and the close of the sixth day with this little moving average pattern I'm going to show you in a minute. But no sooner than that, and ideally soon after that first week of trading. So what I'm trying to say here is when a, a company is still fairly new, and I'll just pick an arbitrary number, but let's say 20 days or less or 100 days or less, somewhere in that range, the sooner the better, that's where you're going to get your biggest pop and your best opportunities. However, what's kind of amazing is there's still something there longer term. When that IPO makes a new high, even if it's months from now, it's still a very tradable pattern. It's still very relative and they take off. Now, the longer they're out, they eventually become just a regular stock and it becomes more, you would use more of my core methodology to trade the IPOs. And that's kind of cool. But the good thing there is, even after they've been out a couple of years, I call those toddlers, they're still, they're still a little bit of a better edge in those because there's still some excitement in those particular stocks. 
Now, let me show you a very simple setup that will keep you, get you into hot IPOs and keep you out of trouble. I think I originally named this presentation a simple setup to, keep, to get you into hot IPOs and keep you out of crappy ones. And when I went to present that about a year ago to someone, they, they changed the title. But uh, Round the Clock Trader left that in, which I thought was kind of cool. So kudos to them. Now, I had to put the little word often keep you out of trouble because you will occasionally have a loss. And as I often say, I probably would make a lot more money in my educational business if I didn't talk about the fact that you always, not always, but you, there's always a chance, I should say, for a loss. All predictions are what? About the future. And a lot of stuff can happen between now and then. So let's talk about the Landry Light IPO trading system. Mike gave me that. Mike, are you here? Mike gave me the, the word Landry Light. I, I called it Daylight, and then it became Dave Light, and now it's becoming Landry Light. And I'll show you what that is in just one second. So with Landry Light, the – hey, Mike, good to see you, buddy. The low must be – with this system or pattern, whatever you want to call it, or setup, the low must be above the five-day moving average. In other words, there's Daylight. You could see light in between the low of the price and the moving average. And then the stock must close at a new high with one caveat. If day one sets the new high for the first week of trading, it must also close above that high. And that's it. That's, that's the whole system right there. Obviously, you need a little money management, but that's pretty much it. So in this particular case here, and I have some animations coming up that will maybe show it a little bit better. This stock comes public. This is day one, this is day two, this is day three, this is day four, this is day five. That's your first week of trading. So any close above the highest close, in this case would be this day here, and don't worry, I'm going to go through several examples, would be a buy, provided, of course, that the low is also above the five-day simple moving average. Now, the reason I came up with the five-day simple moving average was, again, being forced to do some research, which is awesome. I said, well, what indicator would keep you out for the first five days? Well, the way Telechart works, and I don't know if it's like this in other packages, so you might need to be careful, but that indicator does not begin to plot until day six. So here's another example. And in this particular example, notice that the high was set on day one for the week, okay? Okay. So you have five days of trading, and you don't know where that high is going to be until after the first five days. So it would look something like this. Let's say day one, day two, day three, day four, day five. Well, obviously the high is on day two here. But sometimes you'll have this, day one, day two, day three, day four, day five. Out of the first five days, where's your high? There. So in a case like this, and let's say the close is like right here or something, a high close for the week, the close for the trade would also have to be greater than that. So we're actually looking to enter a trade on the close. It's a little unnatural to do that, but once you do it a few times, it actually becomes kind of fun to do. And you just set an alarm, so or an alert, I should say, or an alarm to let you know that the stock is – close to a trigger or could trigger. Now, in some cases, it's a little tricky because you don't know until after the close at the close of a new high. But in those cases where it's not obvious, what I do is just say, well, I want to see it about a quarter point above that high or 25%, 25 cent above that high. So in this particular case, on this particular stock, the high was set on day one. So you would also have to take out that high. And again, you have daylight. So your buy would be on that particular day. There, when it closed both at a new closing high and above the high for day one. Now here's another example where the high was set on day one. Very important to also close above that day one high. So that's your five day closing high. So that would be your, your entry if day one was in a new closing high. But in this particular case, Day one was the highest close of those five days. So your new entry becomes above the high, a close above the high of that day. And then, of course, you also need the daylight, or as I'll learn how to call it from now on, Landry light. 
So again, you would buy in a close. So in this particular case, it's pretty obvious it's going to close. So one minute before the close, it's pretty obvious it's going to close at a brand new high, which is also above the high of day one. Now, if you do miss that closing trade, my research has shown that the next open can be a good time to buy. The only problem there, as I've said recently, is that it could add a list or a additional, I should say, decisions to your process. Now, in trading, we want to try to reduce as many decisions that we make as possible. With every decision comes stress, no matter how small the decision is. So if you are coming into the next day and you did not take the trade, if the stock gaps open, then you're faced with the decision, do I chase it or do I wait for it to come back in? If it starts coming back in, it's a big open and gap reversal. Do you buy as that stock's dropping or just sit on your hands? So it becomes a lot more difficult and a lot more decisions on what to do for that next open. And you'll have to define that for yourself. I think you're better off getting in on that new closing high. And if you think about it, at a new closing high, everybody's happy. And if it happens early in the process, the insiders I don't think can sell, but anybody else who's bought the IPO is happy. And the shorts in general can't come out. I think, again, I think the market maker can short, but that's usually just to provide stock when they do that for other people to buy. And, you know, I don't want to dig myself in too big of a hole on all the mechanics. I just know that they're, in general, they're harder to short, which creates less noise in the market. And that's one of the great things, again, about the IPOs. And, of course, there's the quiet period where the company can't say anything for, I think it's three months, but it does vary in some cases. And, again, I, I did the research for all this years ago, so it's all in the IPO course. But what happens is there's a quiet period, and then the, the first – news announcement and the first earnings or news announcement and everything, it always seems to be a positive one. And that's because that was written three months before the company comes public. So there is a little bit of manipulation that goes on with IPOs. And if they just come out and implode, then somebody really screwed up and didn't do their job. Now, the mother of all examples for this particular pattern was... T-L-R-Y. So if we look at our five-day patterns, and this was on my Landry list, and I did have some clients that that took it. So I hate to show a stock like this because it's, it's so incredible. But the point is it can be done. This is what it looks like when it's fantastic. So we got our first week worth of trading. Notice that the high for week one wasn't set until day three, okay? And... Again, you're not going to know the high of the week before the week is over. If you do, then talk to me. Maybe we can work out some deals. But I doubt you would talk to me if you knew that. Anyway, so when the stock closes at a new closing high and there's Landry Light, there it is, Landry Light, you would actually buy in the close. And sometimes it's hard to do, and I realize that. Would you, again, not to beat the dead horse, something I would never do. <laughs> By the way, Mike, I'm wearing your shirt if I knew. <laughs> I got to go out in public later. I guess I'll wear it. Anyway, Mike got me a, a shirt that says, if I knew, you'd never see my fat arse again. Because if I knew what the high would be for the week before the week was over, you'd never see my fat arse again. Anyway, so you can see in this particular case, we had a close that was well above the high close, and we had Landry Light. So it made it worthwhile. The thing that the Landry Light gives you with this is, Sometimes you can have a marginal new closing high and there's not much acceleration. But when you have the Landry light, there suggests that there is a little bit of acceleration. If you know me, I don't really use indicators that much, but I do occasionally use a moving average. And Landry light can be very useful when you're using the moving averages. And the beauty of this pattern is it gives you a little acceleration in addition to that breakout characteristic of it closing at a new high. And by the way, the great thing about a new closing high is it's a little stealthy and people don't realize it right away. They, they're probably focused on the all-time highs and things like that. But a new closing high, and this works in general for our stocks and for indices and things like that. Usually when you get a new closing high, you'll usually see some follow-through at least from that. And at IPOs, 
it's especially true. And then obviously we know what happened with the TLRY afterwards. Now, as I said earlier, one of the more common patterns next to die, D-Y-E, <laughs> need to fix that. Next to fly and die, it should be D-I-E, is the propensity for a stock to fly and die. So next to the die and die, the most common pattern, one of the most common patterns would be the fly and the die. And because of this propensity, money management is crucial. So here's a trade I actually took. One, two, three, four, five. So now we have a five-day closing high. And we had some Landry light. And then got a nice little pop a couple of days later out of the trade. Took partial profits, and then what happened? Well, it got stopped out on the remainder. In this particular case, if memory serves, I, I lost a little bit more than where that stop is. I didn't want to confuse the issue with facts for this presentation, but that's where your stop should have been, and I got stopped out a little bit earlier, a little bit uh, later, but I think I made a little money overall on this one. But the point is, you can get in on the fly and be willing to stop out on the die. This isn't the greatest example in example town, but sometimes you'll get a really good run before it begins to implode, before it begins to die. But even on a trade like this, it's better than the poke in the eye. You're in for a week and a half or so, and you made really, really good money. Now, I hate to play that fun with statistics game, but if you annualize that, make it a pop like this, that's a pretty impressive run. And if you do that enough, you'll be doing really, really well. Now, again, as I said earlier, there is some longer-term potential in IPOs, even if they've been public for months and sometimes even years when they go on to make new highs. And the beauty of this little simple little pattern is it's going to wake up and let you know when you are hitting those brand new highs. Now, what... I like to do, and I was, uh, and that's where I met Mike that we talked about earlier. <laughs> hey, Mike, again. Uh, Charlie Kirk uses a lot, a lot of alerts, and I'd used alerts before, but I didn't realize how many he used. And because they're free, put in as many as you want. So what I have begun doing quite a bit with these IPOs, even though I'm looking at all of these IPOs daily, I've begun to add a whole bunch of alerts. In the middle of the day, I get a text in an email saying, hey, this uh, stock is above this level. So it kind of wakes me up to possible action on that. And so far, that's actually made me some money on some stocks that I would have possibly overlooked. Anyway, this is Ferrari, R-A-C-E. It took it a long time to get going. It looked like it was just going to be a die and die type of situation. But sometimes these stocks die out, they get their act together, and then they begin to rise from the ashes. It's sort of like a Phoenix type of strategy that I've talked about quite a bit. And I'm going to show you one live example, which isn't necessarily this pattern, but it's kind of that Phoenix characteristic, just to kind of throw you out a little, a little extra something to look for. So here's one on day one. It made a new high, and then it generally just kind of, after a brief little rally, it just kind of died out for a long, 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 long time. Is what June, then July, then August, Monday, Thursday, Tuesday, Wednesday. <laughs> it went down for a long, long, long time. And a lot of people may have forgotten about it. And again, just throwing out a little tip here. This is where you'd say, okay, well, this thing has kind of died out of here. But let me just throw in an alert because it's free to alert me when this thing begins to wake up. And notice that because the high was set on day one, it has to do what? It has to close above the high of day one. And that didn't happen for a long, long time. But eventually, it did, and the stock, as you can see, took off nicely before coming back in hard. And you would have gotten stopped out on that retrace. Badu, yet another example. High was set on day one. It died out for two and a half months. Nothing happened. You might have forgotten about it, but then look, look what happens. Makes a new closing high, and also there's Landry Light. Now, let me show you a couple of live trades real quick. In fact, let me go, let me walk over to the trading station, see if I'm still long. Hang on. Yeah, it looks like I'm still long this one. I jinxed it by talking about it yesterday. It's like uh, I talked about it during the day. It was doing great. Use it as an example. I'll look proud of it. Hey, look at me. 
and then uh, the trading gods smacked me, and it dropped like three points yesterday. But that's okay. This is like normal behavior for an IPO. Now, did I drop an F-bomb? Yes. Am I interviewing myself? Yes. <laughs> was it on David Letterman that used to have John McCain interviews himself? Oh, my God. It was so damn funny. That's where I got that. Anyway, I actually got long this one a day before the entry on the Landry Light five-day SMA pattern. We're going to have to come up with a better name for that. But you can see we have one, two, three, four, five days of trading. The high was set on what day? Come on. You can do it. Day two. Very good. Somebody's paying attention. And then we have a five-day closing high, which is actually the buy at B pattern. And then we had Landry Light the following day. And then you would have bought on close on that day following this five-day SMA Landry Light pattern. Now, the initial profits would have been at this level here. And once again, admission of guilt. I actually took profits the day before because I had miscalculated where my profit target should be. In this particular case, we were using a two-point stop, so two points risk, which means initial profit target is two points higher. But Dave, does it have a negative expectancy? No, 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 because what we're doing is we're willing to hold on to the second loaf, the second half of the position for hopefully a long, 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 long time and ride out that longer-term trend, at least until the sardine begins to stink. Now, this one doesn't fit the strategy, but it could eventually. But the only thing is, in a case like this, when they come public and die out and they get their act together and they make a nice little pattern, in this particular case, I think it was a bow tie, which is just three moving averages coming together. For you guys who don't know, over a short period of time, gives the appearance of a bow tie. And also, it was a very nice and persistent Move from the lows. Notice it came public. A little bit too much excitement here. Died out. Looks like it was going to die out forever. But then it kind of bottomed out and made a nice persistent move higher. To those of you who are familiar with William O'Neill, who popularized the cup and handle. I don't think he invented it, but he certainly popularized it, so I'll give him credit for that. It's also a cup and handle. And this was the actual entry, okay? And this was the initial profit target, three points. But Dave, three points, that sounds like a lot for a low price stock. Well, that's what it calls for. The HV was ridiculous on this one. So that's why it's so high. Anyway, so 950 was the entry, I think right around there. And then add three points to that, 1050, 1150, 1250. So I think right around here was your initial profit target on that one. So the point I'm trying to make here is that use a little money management in this. And then keep an eye on the IPOs when they're fairly new, even if they've been around for several months. But the pioneer patterns, such as the one I showed you a few minutes ago, are going to be your best bet. But longer term, there's still promise in the IPOs. Okay, any questions about any of this before we open it up to the live charts? If you guys want to start asking about while we went on questions, if y'all want to start asking about individual stocks, feel free to do so now. We'll spend a few minutes talking about the overall market, and then we'll get to your stock pick. So again, if you go to trade IPOs, and then I forgot how many months I put in here. Three months. I didn't mean to put three. I meant to put like two. But I'll give you three months to the members area too, and that way you can see all the newer IPO research, which will become part of this IPO course too. By the way, if you buy a course, you have unlimited access, lifetime access, and lifetime support. Now, by support, I mean that if you're confused about a concept, then you can certainly email me on it, and I can cover it in a Q&A session or give you a direct answer. It depends on whether the answer requires a lot of thought or not. And for the members area, though, if you're in the members area, you have to remain a member of the members area for support there, okay? All right, Greg says, with Goss, if it holds the prior breakout area, 20-ish, and begins to move higher, would you add or take that as another setup? Okay, sometimes what we do, if you've been following along at home, is we will swing trade around a core position. So let me talk about that. I don't think that's your exact question, but let me get that out of the way and then 
I'll elaborate a little further. So by swing trading around a core position, what I'm saying is, let's say we get along our little IPO pattern, like right here, and our moving average is down here. I'm not gonna draw the moving average, that's gonna confuse things, but let's just assume we get along on this particular day on this little pattern that you just learned, and this stock begins to rally, and let's say you put on a 1,000 shares, and let's say right here, that's your profit target. You take off a th uh, 500, take off half, and it keeps rallying up nicely. And then it begins to pull back, but it doesn't do anything wrong. It just kind of pulls back. So it kind of looks like that. OK, so what you could do is you could say, well, I'm going to follow the core methodology. My core methodology in general trades pullbacks. <laughs> Some guy came up to me once in late 1999. That pullback thing you invented put two of my daughters through college. Thank you. The guy was about to hug me. He was almost crying. I'm like, dude, I didn't invent the pullback. I just I just popularized it. Anyway, I guess it's kind of vain to say that, but it was kind of exciting for me to know that somebody was paying attention. And we it's also the greatest bull market in, in, <laughs> in history. I guess you could have done anything. Anyway, so let's say you decide to put on 500 on a trigger. So if it triggers, and let's keep it easy. Let's just say we're looking for two points. So it rallies up two points, you would take off 500 again, okay? So you just put another $1,000 in your pocket. So let's say you made 1,000 on your first loaf, okay? And then you went ahead and swing traded around that core position. You pulled off another 1,000, okay? And then you continue to trail the stop. And then hopefully, I know I just said hope, but you, you stick with that position for a long, long time. I know I rushed through that. If you go in the members area, I have some much slower and longer presentations on that if you want to learn more about swing trading around a core position. Now, let me finish his setup. So Greg says, with costs, if it holds above the prior breakout area and it gets to move higher, would you add or take that as another setup? Uh, yes, I would do both, okay? If I get stopped out, I have a stop in there today, okay? If I get stopped out, then I might reevaluate it as a new setup in and of itself, okay? If I don't get stopped out, then I think, depending on how the chart sets up, but it might set up over the next day or two as a pullback. I'd actually, it's like I hate to say this because I don't want to get knocked out, but I'd actually prefer a tiny bit deeper pullback. And this is another one. This is actually another IPO pattern. I'm glad you brought it up. It could be one of two things. It's your first pullback or your first deep retracement. Two very similar patterns. So if you are just starting in IPOs, maybe you're better off waiting for the first pullback. And that's a little bit more of a secondary pattern. It's not going to be as lucrative as buying earlier in the process, but it's probably going to be a little bit less risky. So with risk comes reward. So the getting in this one would have been, let's see, one, two, three, four, five. Four, one, two, three, four. I was actually long on this day. I think your actual trigger on the moving average pattern was this day. And again, take partial profits, etc. But if you're not stopped out, yes, it might be worth an add-on trade like I just explained. Okay, getting back, let's say a thousand shares, put on 500 shares somewhere, let's say like 22 and a half, and then flip them out at 24 and a half, which would be right around the prior highs, and that would actually be a good place to do that. So. Does that make sense to everybody? Is everybody kind of up to speed on that? To move higher, would you add or take that as another setup? Yeah, both. the answer to both of those is yes. So if I get stopped out today, then I would take it as a new setup. If I don't get stopped out today, then I might look to add to my position. So the, the answer is yes to both questions. Okay. I want to do a quick rundown of the markets, and we'll get to your individual stock picks. Okay, so ST inning would have been bought yesterday. No. Oh, yeah. Okay, yeah. I'm sorry. Now, in a case like this, I, I'm not as excited about rushing out to buy this particular stock just because of the way it kind of set up after such a deep V retracement. And I don't want to talk out of both sides of my mouth. There are some cases where I'm not as excited to buy these stocks in a pattern like this. I would much rather this pattern happen on more of a pioneer type of basis. In other words, early in the process, 
but I hear you and I think you are correct. Let's just verify everything. So let's see, one, this would be your closing high on day two. I'm sorry, your all time high is on day two. So yeah, based on this pattern, you would have bought it. Hold on, let's see. Yes, yesterday would have been a trigger. Now in a case like this, I, I can tell you flat out, I did not buy it. I saw it, but I decided not to go after it, okay? And it's just the way the, I just don't like the way the setup looks. So I'm not saying you want to rush out and trade these mechanically, although I do think mechanically there's definitely something there. In a case like this, I would prefer to trade it more like the core methodology, meaning that I would wait for that next pullback. In a case like QTT, I decided to trade it more like the core methodology, and that got you long long before your official trigger, which would be up here at 20 something. Okay. So when they make that big V look, I prefer to just see if there's some other type of pattern to get in. So again, on this QTT, you see a little bow tie down here. Your entry is right here and so far. So good. Knock on wood. I hope I don't jinx it like I jinxed the goss yesterday. Okay. I bought it on, bought it at 24 on the cup. Uh, which one was that the prior one? Yeah, okay. I hear you. Um, it doesn't look perfect to me, but I hear you. Let's take a look at that So yeah, it's not that's not bad. I hear you kind of made a cup and handle and it took off. That's cool You know, I, I am okay with these getting back. Let's take a look at HUIA. That's the other one that were long or another one that were long I should say um Notice that it did the fly, it did the die, and then it bottomed out again. Sometimes you get that next wave higher, which I call a fly, die, fly, okay? So it was a little bit unorthodox, but if you look kind of closely, it did kind of bottom out nicely in here. It also made a nice little almost textbook bow tie, okay? And then we triggered in here. We were doing really good for a while, came right back in. And this is why trend following is hard sometimes. I think I'm going to use this as an example of why trend following is hard. It's hard to be underwater for two or three weeks in the trade and honor your stop and just stay with the trade and not be tempted to bail out. The market's going to tempt you to do the wrong thing. I don't want to get too far into the psychology of things. But trend following is hard and make no bones about it. But it's the only way to make money. Okay, Greg says, yes, makes sense. Just curious, is this set up for me right now? Yeah, I think it's I think it's in the process of setting up. I'd like to see maybe one more day. Um, in a case like Goss, I'd almost, I mean, forgetting that I'm long, if this would have been, now, it can trade thinly, so be careful. But if this knockout bar would have been lower than this bar here, then I would trade it more like a, ten, a trend knockout. But if it keeps pulling back, I would trade it more like a pullback. I should give you a plug and say, thanks. Pay a lot of attention to IPOs after your course and have learned how to get in at different points. Yeah, Phil, thank you for that. And, and it, I agree. It forces me to look at these stocks like an HUYA and a QTT and say, okay, these stocks might not jump out at me as bow ties or first thrusts or whatever transitional type of pattern I'm looking for. But the fact that there are IPOs, I pay a little bit more careful attention to them. I have a database just of IPOs I look at every day. And I look at the more recent IPOs, the ones that are public over the last 100 days or so. And then I also look at those that have come public over the last year or two. And I constantly call stocks out of this list if they're real thin or real choppy or whatever, or if they just died out for weeks or months. I'll just take them off the list and maybe put an alert in or something or know that my other database is going to pick it up in the main stock database. But, yeah, th that has also forced me, and another advantage of me having an educational business, it has forced me to look harder at these IPOs for particular patterns. And I hate to say this, uh, <laughs> but, you know, my only regret with the IPO course is that I've lost clients from my core trading service because they've done so well in IPOs. They're like, Dave, I don't need you doing that other analysis. It's like, well, 
it this bull market might not go on forever. If it does, you have the tools. If it goes away and then comes back, you still have the tools. But in some cases, there are other things that you might want to be doing, like shorting big cap stocks when the market is rolling over or just beginning to roll over like we did a few months back. There may be cases where you want you might be buying big cap energy stocks off of bow ties and things like that. We had a few huge big winners. I think it was a year or two ago when energy's bottomed out and skyrocketed. Same thing goes for gold and other stocks. So again, sometimes it looks like the church of what's happening now with me. And as a trend follower or a trend following moron, as some people call me, then that is the case. I am going to where that action is. I am going to trade where the action is. But I would I would encourage you not to be too myopic and just do IPOs. Although I have to say it's been a really fun ride. <laughs> Greg says, you're giving away too much information on IPOs in these free webinars. I've created my own strategy from one of your free Thursday webinars a few years ago. Yeah, you know, I have a bad problem in business. I think I'm still stuck back in the Internet days where you give away everything for free, but you make it up in volume. <laughs> now, I have a lot. There's a lot. As you know, there's a lot more to a lot of the things I'm saying in the courses and in the members area. What I like to do though, is I like to give you enough to show you that this stuff can work and it is pretty damn simple. And you can take that and say, well, okay, if he's giving me this, what else is there? What else could make this even better? And that's kind of the thinking that from a sneaky little bastard standpoint, <laughs> I want you to think of. No, I'm not gonna get in a rented jet, <laughs> you know, they never show these jets flying. It's always like on the ground or something. Hey, look at me in front of a jet. No, trading is not that easy. I know I make it look easy sometimes, but it's not. Trust me. I've already dropped a few F-bombs. And now that I'm in, a, I'm in a rental house right now because we're building our house, which is going to have a separate office with insul insulated walls. So I've been really cognizant of my F-bombs. But, yes, I get frustrated and drop some F-bombs here and there. I dropped a few this morning, by the way. All right, let's take a look at the overall market, and then let's take a look at your stock picks. A lot of uh, good interaction today. Thank you, guys, uh, and good crowd, too. So thank you so much, and girls. Uh, the peas. All right, well, we're down a little today. Nothing to sneeze at. We're kind of just kind of meandering in here. I sure would like to see us get past these prior little peaks. As I've been saying, ad nauseum. We are very overbought, fairly short term and over the intermediate term. And a lot of people like, Dave, how do you gauge overbought? Well, let's go back a couple of days. The market rallied 15.70% in a couple of months. There's been many years where it hasn't rallied 15%. I did a presentation a while back in the Q&A section under the members area where I showed over the past 10 years, there were only a couple of years where the market went up more than 10%. So in last year was a down year. So it's overbought based on that metric. And if you take a look at a weekly chart, so far it just looks like a big picture retracement. Now, here's the deal. If we measure from the all-time closing high to where we are today as of 12 o'clock Eastern time, the market is down only 4%. So several big updates will put you at brand new highs. And then maybe the market is off to the races. Here is my big concern. I am a man on the street kind of guy. I rented a truck a few days ago and the guy running the office had on CNBC. And I told him that I dabbled a little bit in the market and he really didn't seem very interested in what I had to say. It's kind of like pulling teeth, but I did get him to talk a little bit. And he said two things. I'm glad I held on. And I wish I'd have bought more at the low. I'm like, I, I, I really had to bite my tongue because I wanted to say that'll work until it don't. But I tell you, the little nugget of information that I got from him was worth far more than what I had to pay for the rental truck. Because my thinking is. Everyone who did not bail in December and is still holding on 
is feeling like, oh man, I dodged a bullet. Uh, no, I'm sorry. Let me rewind that. Everyone who didn't bail in December is thinking, man, I am so glad I held on. But here's the deal. If that market begins to sell off in earnest, they could all run for the door at the same time. And that's what's got me a little bit nervous about this market. Now, let's put in a 50 day moving average and go back to a weekly chart so it becomes a 50 week moving average and we'll do this let's make it red okay so obviously we're well above the 50 day moving average let's go to a weekly chart and if we can hang around here this week we'll have one day of landry light above the 50 week moving average okay now, what does the TFM 10% system say? It says, well, if you're within 10% of all-time closing highs of a market on a weekly basis and you have two weeks or two bars, however you want to look at it, but two weeks where the lows are greater than the 50-week moving average, then you buy the market, okay? On the sell side, if you're greater than 10% away, from the all-time highs and the close is below the 50-week moving average, then you sell the market or go short. Now, you don't want to follow it mechanically on the way down, mechanically on the way up. You obviously want to have some money management in place to where you're taking profits along the way and then waiting for the next signal, maybe even stopping out, okay? I'm not a, what do you call it when you flip from buy to sell? stop and reverse. I'm not a stop and reverse kind of guy. I'm more of a follow a system type of guy. In fact, everything I do is discretionary. So I'm not actually following a system mechanically. I'm just following these this research that I found. And by the way, this is another little system I found in trying to teach market timing because the kind of using a combination of Landry Light, like we talked about earlier, and the fact that if a market is to go new highs, as long as it's gonna to have to go through B, right? And as long as you're close to C, then you wanna stay long a market. If you're close to B on the way back down, then you wanna be out of the market. Anyway, I know a long way, long winded uh, today, but if you take the market timing course under members, you'll, I'll show you that particular system again, giving away everything for free, making up in volume. All right, NASDAQ, or as you used to call it, NASQAQ. There's a lady I used to work with, and she called it a NASQAQ. And uh, anyway, that's where the origin of NASQAQ came from. <laughs> it's so funny. I have so many people still email me today because I started calling it the quack. And people are like, hey, you notice the quack got whacked? I'm like, yeah, sure did. Uh, anyway, well above the 50-week, I'm sorry, 50-day moving average, kind of flats fill in here. Everything I said about the P's pretty much applies to the NASDAQ and also the Rusty. You can see, and let's take a look at weekly on a rusty. And if you back the chart way out, you can see it looks fairly ugly in here, although it looked fairly ugly back here. And this was a pretty big spill, FYI. This was, if memory serves, that was also a weekly bow tie. And for all intents and purposes, we're still under this weekly bow tie sell signal, okay? Doesn't mean you want to still be short the market but it does suggest longer term that the market could be in trouble. And remember, we had this one back here, and we had a pretty serious slide from that, nearly 20% slide from this weekly bow tie. So nothing to sneeze at when a market makes a weekly bow tie. I don't want to bore you too much. I know, too late, right? But if you go back in and look at, like, the P's, the weekly bow ties, and also a 50-week moving average for that matter, would help to keep you on the right side of every major bull market and bear market in history. No guarantees, obviously, you want to guarantee by a toaster, but it is something that you want to pay attention to. Okay, uh, let me just go through a few sectors real quick. Most look like the market itself, so there's not a whole lot to discuss. There's the financials, as you can see, still have a little bit of overhead re resistance or supply to overcome, also overbought like the market, so just kind of keep that thought in your mind as you go through the sector. So most of them, again, kind of look like the market itself. Looks like the metals are getting hit a little bit in here. My problem with the metals is they just have a lot of overhead supply to deal with. 
And again, most areas, with the exception of like foods got whacked in here. Everybody was being a little shot on Friday about Warren Buffett. Hey, you know, <laughs> we all have a turn in the barrel. Drugs are pretty impressive, coming back nicely. My my big problem with drugs and the market overall is that when you have these V-shaped recoveries at high levels, it's just very hard to sustain. Drugs might be a bad example of that. Let's go back to the P's real quick. You see how the market fell out of bed and then made this big V recovery? Well, it's hard to mount a new leg on top of an old leg without quite a bit of correction, corrective type action or consolidation. So that's got me a little nervous about that. But in general, most sectors look pretty good. A couple sectors getting whacked in here, here and there, like HMOs, I think, got whacked yesterday. Foods, as I mentioned earlier, got whacked. But overall, nothing really coming unglued for the most part, looking pretty good. Let's take a look at the semis. Semis are looking pretty darn good in here. Somehow they've managed to get through all this overhead supply. So the next leg here will be crucial. Big fan of the semis following along with the overall market for a little confirmation. Let's take a look at bonds real quick. You notice utilities just banging out new highs. Really not a whole lot to talk about in bonds. Kind of all over the place, beginning to weaken a little bit in here as of late. And then we'll take a look at gold because everybody wants to look at gold, right? Uh, gold looks pretty good, shorter term, kind of a pullback. It's a little choppy, but gold can be choppy. I mean, you have to kind of give it a bit of a pass. But as I said earlier with the metals and mining, my big problem is all this overhead supply that they have to deal with. All right, let's uh, open it up for individual or let's keep it open for individual questions and see how many we can get through stocks. I mean, uh, GPN, yeah, put it on your momentum list, okay? But uh, it's not set up at this particular juncture. Also, it's kind of that V-shaped recovery thing. So, yeah, put it on your momentum list, but I wouldn't rush out and trade it right away. KHC for Mark. KHC. No. Is that a joke? <laughs> no. Have you not been to these presentations? You know how I kick people out. You want to buy this? No. No. I mean, unless you're playing a crazy opening gap reversal, which I suggest you not do, don't do that, okay? Are you just saying it's, that's the stock that Buffett got creamed on? All right. Uh, Donald, let's talk about ADMS. Yeah, that's kind of interesting in that it's kind of a cup and handle type of bottom or cup and handle lee. Let's see if it's a bow tie. Yeah, it's a bow tie. That's not bad. It's got it's got some overhead supply along the way, uh, but that's not too bad. I'm I'm almost willing to give you a high five on that one. A little wide and loose, not exactly perfect, but it's not bad. It's really not bad at all. So ideally, I'd like a little bit more pullback, but sometimes with these bow ties, you have to be willing to go with them. But yeah, I would definitely put that on your watch list under the not bad column. So pretty good on that, Donald. Good job. Long TCRR. That's gonna be a that's gonna be an IPO. Um, it's a little on the thin side. Let's take a look at a couple things here. But it, it can have some good size days. Okay. Now, with one of the caveats is I do like a little bit of range for the first week of trading. But I hear you. It did. Uh, the range didn't come until the this day here. Let's see what that range is on this thing. Uh, 15, 16. Yeah, I'd like to see, usually I like to see a little bit more range, and this is why I didn't go after it. But it's tricky because you got your range the day after you would have gotten a setup. Um, in a case like this, I would not take this trade as a new trade, but see what happens, and it might be worth a secondary type of pattern, such as a, Core methodology pullback or something. Phil was talking about ALKS. Uh, I'm not seeing it or feeling it. Now, Phil, it's just, uh, yeah, I don't know what you're seeing. And it's got some really bad memories to it. It's kind of all over the place. I would pass on that. MRNA, that's going to be another IPO. Y'all all over it. Okay, now technically it did, and this is kind of that V-ish shape we talked about earlier. 
Um, obviously, it made its new high on day one. So two days ago, you would have gotten long based on the five-day SMA Dave pattern, or <laughs> whatever we're going to call that damn thing. Um, it's not bad. What I would do in this particular case, a case like this, is I would wait for it to – I'd wait to see if it continues to rally and then look to play a pullback. Again, I just keep coming back to Goss because I think it's a good example. Notice that the Goss triggered very early in this process, okay? So that's what got me excited about that. So I sort of take them a lot more on a case-by-case -case basis the longer they've been public. UPWK also hitting brand new highs. It's kind of all over the place, but I hear you on that one, Howard. And it, I suppose, let's see, when would it have triggered something? Uh, the new high was set when? On day one. So you have to close above that. And again, it's another one of those V-shaped type of deals. But it's not bad. So, yeah, you would have been long. Um, you'd be long on today's close with this pattern if and if only, if and only if it closes above this line that I have drawn in here. So if it comes back in, then no signal or no trigger. So ST&E would have been bought yesterday. Did we talk about that one? Yeah, we talked about that one. Yeah. So, yeah, Phil. Uh, I'm not long UPWK. I'm EYN. That's one I was looking at too. That's why I know all these. Yeah, this is more of like um like a pullback type of setup. It does have some bad memories back here, but it's not bad. Okay, HV is kind of crazy at 124. It's a little wild and crazy. Uh, maybe an entry above this high and just play it like a pullback. Okay. It's not bad. It's just a little, eh, it could, it could trade a little wide and loose, but you could certainly do worse. Greg says, keep it up and left. <laughs> Let's talk about Greg since he's left. No, we're not going to talk about Greg. Long Eton Thin. Yeah, I mean, that's, see, that's the other thing too. This one's super thin. This did catch my eye, but it's just too thin, okay? The it's only what 34,000 shares today. I mean, if somebody tries to dump some a decent amount of shares in the market, even some of these ones like Goss, I mean, we got whacked, I got whacked three points in it yesterday. So I'm glad you brought this one up because you do have to adjust for the volatility. And I was somebody on Facebook was saying, just buy good stocks so you don't have to worry about them imploding on you. It's like, no, that's BS because the manager might decide because his secretary is an ex soft porn star. I did the research, so you know, I these things I make sure I research them carefully. Honey, I'm doing some research. Uh, it's not what you think. Uh <laughs> I guess now we're in the same house, so I have to be careful when I'm doing that research. But anyway, uh Hewlett Packard decide that the CEO decides to uh, do a lot of groping on his secretary. And the company lost, I forget how much, but it was it was in the billions overnight. And it was that's a stodgy, big, fat, big, fat company been around forever, right? So there are no good companies. We are traders and bad things can still happen. And that's why I say better the devil you know. So I know these volatility. Oh, look, how ironic is that? I had no idea the stock imploded today. Look at that, okay? So this is a huge, how ironic. Isn't that ironic, don't you think? <laughs> I didn't have extra coffee today, I swear. But, yeah, look at that. I, I mean, I wonder what happened. I wonder if somebody got groped, huh? <laughs> so when was that? Anybody remember that? Anybody long around? The day, I think that, uh, it was in October of when my first book came out that that happened. So uh, my the layman's or something. I forget when it happened. So whenever layman's came out, 2010 maybe? The stock imploded overnight. Looks like they've come public again or something. But anyway, but yeah, look at this. A stodgy, look at the HV, 26, and that's probably counting today's date, today's data. Without that, it probably was uh, much lower. I don't have time. I, I can't plot the HV on this particular system quickly. But if somebody would give me yesterday's HV on this, that would be fantastic for an example. So the thing is that there are no... 
safe stocks or good stocks because bad things can happen even in something like a stock like this, which barely moves at all. So in those IPOs, what do you do? Well, you adjust your share size down accordingly. And the article that I posted on Facebook was Better the Devil You Know. And if you do a search on my website, you can find that article. And it's still in the public domain. I haven't put everything behind the firewall yet. So if you want to go out and take a look at that article, it's there at least now. Better the Devil You Know is the, is the title of that article, something about volatile stocks. Anyway, long story endless. I know it's too late. What I talked about in that article was the share size based on your stop size, based on the volatility of the stock, in that a stock that seems lower in volatility might actually be riskier than a high volatility type of stock. And this is a great case in point. This move here, this is a fat tail type of move, black swan type of move that should not have happened. HV of H, okay, so it was only so it's 25.73. Well, the overall market is what? What's the spies? Spies are 21. So that would be like that's thank you, Donald. Let's put this in perspective, okay? That would be like you came in today, and I know there's circuit breakers and stuff, but stick with me. But that would be like coming in today in the SP 500. Let's take a look at the P's would be down like 17%, okay? So that's kind of, that's a little ridiculous. What would that be? One, and the P's are at about, let's just use 2,800. So that would be like you come in today and the P's would be trading in the 2,300s. So it's like P's were here yesterday and then you come in today, they're down here, okay? That's, that's the magnitude of that move. And it's so ironic that I was talking about HPQ. I had no idea. So that's a black swan type event, which gives you a beautiful example of how like trading. Let's take a look at QTT. It's one more long, has an HP of 110. Well, we know it's going to be a wild and crazy stock. And it might move 16% in one day. That's okay because we adjust for the volatility. We know the devil. We can expect it. We might drop an F-bomb. I'm not sure why I'm talking like Jackie Mason. But <laughs> is he still with us? I think he passed, didn't he? Sorry, I'm still in a bit, Jackie Mason. But anyway, better the devil you know when it comes to these things. So, yeah, it will be kind of wild and crazy if you're trading the IPOs. Absolutely. But you're going to reduce, reduce your share size down. Accordingly, I was kind of surprised when I was looking at uh, my trading service for one we're looking to get long today. It's like it's only 600 shares or less than 600 shares, I think, on a 100K account or per 100K. So you've got $100,000 and you're only buying 600 shares of this IPO. And I forget the exact price of it, but it wasn't that much when you when you figure it out, like a very small amount. Like maybe less than 10% of your account would be in that one particular stock. Okay, uh, this is kind of interesting. I like this. Um, I don't trade a pure breakout per se, okay? And who asked about this? Phil? Of course you did. <laughs> uh, but it, I find it interesting that it's breaking out in here. I would wait for one of my secondary patterns, unfortunately, with the five-day SMA pattern type of deal, you'd have to get above this high, okay? But it looks kind of interesting. It's kind of wide and loose, but now it's beginning to break out. I would definitely put this on your momentum list and keep an eye on it. I mean, if you were a pure breakout player, then you could certainly do a lot worse than that. Looks like it's going up while we're talking. J-K-S, J-K-S. For Donald. Yeah, this one looks kind of interesting. Let's back the chart out a little bit. It's kind of wide and loose electrocardiogram longer term. I think I would pass just because it's all over the place. And it's got a lot of overhead supply to overcome. I prefer to find something that's going to be a little bit cleaner with less overhead supply. But I, I hear where you're coming from, Donald. And VNTR. 
also for Donald. Yeah, this one I've been looking at. This one I like better than, than that other one because let's take a look at what's going on here. Okay, so been around for a couple years, so it's what I call a toddler, a year and a half, I guess. And it kind of did a few things. It, it died out, and then it took off, and then it died out, okay? But now it's kind of bottoming out. It's kind of beginning to look like a little bit of a phoenix stock. By the way, stock picking in general today is really good, except for that one stock that was going straight down. I think sometimes you guys test me, come taunt me a second time. But, yeah, that looks kind of interesting in here. Um, I really can't pick it apart too much. Uh, yeah, I think that one's okay. Absolutely. It's got a little overhead supply here and there. I'd almost like to see a little bit more pullback, but if it pulled back too much more, it'd be back into this base. And then it's still kind of a pioneer, not a pioneer, but a uh, transitional setup. And in transitional setups, you can't really sit around and wait for too much pullback. It's not exactly a bow tie, but it's bow tie-ish and cup and handle-ish. So, yeah, I think um, I'll stop short of giving you a high five on that one, but it's not bad. SVMK. Yeah, did we talk about this one? Yeah, we talked about that one. Yeah, several of you are pointing that one out. Good job on that as far as breaking out. Okay. I think we have all the stock questions answered. Here we go. Suggestion for the 5SMA pattern name, Simple 5 Po. I think you talked about me today more than my wife has in the last month. Great presentation, as always. Take care. <laughs> well, Mike is always kind to me, so he's a friendly 5 Po. Okay, Simple 5 Po. Let me think about that. Got to put my name in there somehow, though. All right, last stock, VE, and then we'll have to wrap things up. We're running out of time. Yeah, that one looks pretty good, uh, Howard. Let's take a look, zoom in a little bit. Yeah, I like it. It's, uh, you know, it's, you bottomed out. You got a bow tie. Um, you know, I haven't given, given out a high five today. I'm going to give you a high five on that one, Howard. Good job. That one's been catching my eye because it fly, it flew, I should say. It died, bottomed out, and now you have a bow tie. So, yeah, absolutely. The uh, first high five of the day. But I have to say, everybody else, don't feel slighted because I was really close. So maybe everybody else kind of warmed me up a little bit. I almost said something else, which would be inappropriate. All right. Uh, I think I'm out of time. Thanks, everybody, for coming. Uh, great crowd this week. Thank you so much. Any unanswered questions, shoot me an email at daveatdaywinner.com. I'll either cover it in the members area, answer you directly if it's really, really quick. My carpal tunnel is killing me, so I'm really backing off on emails. But uh, if we don't talk between now and then, everybody have a fantastic weekend. Thank you so much.